morning, uh, everyone. I'm Lorenzo Lamura. Can you be louder? Louder? Okay. <laughs> I'm not used to, to be that louder. So I work uh, at OpenFF, um, thanks to the support of uh, Janssen. Uh, and together, uh, today, together with uh, Biswap from uh, Genentech, I will be talking uh, about assessing charge models by means of atom by atom and dipole comparison. Uh, so why we want to assess charge models? Uh, essentially because atomic partial charges uh, are key for uh, biomolecular simulation as they dictate the electrostatic contribution to intermolecular, intermolecular interactions. Uh, electrostatic interactions uh, between <clears throat> uh, small molecules, drug-like molecules, and the corresponding receptor uh, <clears throat> do not only affect uh, the, the binding free energy, but are also uh, essential for molecular recognition. And therefore, assessing the electrostatic match uh, in protein ligand complexes uh, may, may help us uh, to understand why ligand bind and how we can improve the, the binding, which is the ultimate goal of uh, drug discovery. Uh, what we have here uh, is a picture, a picture of electronically uh, diverse uh, ligands that can bind a receptor with different extent because they can establish uh, different electrostatic interactions. And uh, assigning partial charges correctly in uh, this system uh, means essentially uh, be, being able to model the electrostatic interaction properly and making us able to predict accurately which uh, ligand will bind the, the receptor. So traditionally, uh, uh, I've been show uh, expensive methods were used uh, uh, to generate uh, electrostatic um, potential uh, of molecules uh, to then uh, uh, derive uh, the uh, restricted ESP uh, charge model fit. Uh, but uh, obviously, this uh, method is rather uh, limited uh, by molecular sites and by the number of molecules. And therefore, uh, more recently, uh, uh, semi-empirical uh, methods like AM1-BCC are being used to uh, assign partial charges which uh, reproduce uh, DSP uh, as computed as the Atrifoc level with the 631G uh, start basis, uh, which is a QM method which deliberately uh, overestimate uh, the polarity of gas phase molecules uh, to take into account that uh, it will then uh, produce charges which are suitable for the solvated, uh, solvated system. Nevertheless, um, speed is still uh, uh, a bottleneck, uh, especially if we want to deal to, uh, with virtual screening of large uh, libraries, or we have to deal uh, with a uh, big uh, system like uh, biopolymers. And for this reason, uh, more recently, graph, uh, Neural, neural network uh, charge are being uh, developed for uh, almost instant uh, partial charge assignment. So we performed this uh, benchmark using the OpenFF uh, public data set, uh, which consists of over uh, 9,000 uh, non proprietary compounds coming from six different, uh, from the collection of six different uh, pharma partners. Uh, what we did essentially was first to pull down QM data from QC archive, uh, uh, namely the QM dipoles and the QM optimized uh, 3D coordinates. And then we used the, the, the smiles to compute the charges uh, with the different charge models, OVLS, A1, A1 BCC, A1 BCC. ELF10 and uh, Nagel developed by, by Lilly. And uh, with the first three, so we, we used the, the charges generated with the first three model, uh, and we applied these charges on top of the 3D op, uh, QM optimized coordinates uh, to compute the, the dipoles, and then being able to compare uh, uh, these dipoles with the QM dipoles in terms of uh, angle, difference in length and, uh, and magnitude. And instead we use uh, the last two uh, charge models and I have to thank Trevor for uh, 
uh, having done the, the calculation with the IM1 VCC LF10 uh, to perform an atom by atom comparison. Uh, I will be talking about this uh, latter comparison and then I, I will have, uh, then leave the floor to, to Bill's work uh, to talk about the, the dipole comparison. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we have uh, the benchmark result for, uh, for Nagel. Uh, so first thing to, to notice is the remarkable capability of uh, Nagel to produce charges that can uh, reproduce AM1 VCC LF10 uh, reference charges uh, with the RMSE of uh, only uh, 0 .0, uh, 0 0.01 or 02 electrons. Uh, which is uh, great, uh, and I have to acknowledge Lily for the great uh, work uh, done with their, uh, with their model. And secondly, uh, we found that only 1.3% one, 1 of, the, of the benchmark uh, contains at least uh, one atomic partial charge, uh, which has um, uh, an absolute error of 0.1 electron compared to our uh, reference model. Uh, now, among these uh, outliers, we found that uh, about 60% uh, of molecules uh, of, uh, of, of wrong partial charges were on a uh, uh, carbon atom involved in a double bond, about 50% on uh, aliphatic nitrogen, and about 20% are on, uh, on sulfur. Uh, I am here uh, showing uh, uh, one example for each of these three cases. Uh, with, let's say, a, a notation that uh, is a depiction of the, of the molecule with the atom uh, highlighted with the color map that reflects the charge difference between Nagol and AM1 DCC LF10 charges. Uh, and below, uh, we have the corresponding uh, correlation plot between the two, the two, charge, uh, the two charge models. Uh, also, since uh, these three cases uh, constituted uh, almost uh, all, uh, all the outlier that we found, we also computed the RMSC for uh, these specific cases, uh, meaning that the RMSC uh, only for the double bonded carbon, RMSC only for uh, um, aliphatic nitro nitrogen, and RMSC only for uh, sulfur atoms. So what we found uh, is that uh, the RMSE for uh, double bonded carbon is slightly higher than the, RM the global uh, RMSE for uh, all, the, all the charges, uh, meaning that uh, these pathological cases, they contribute to the, to the RMSE, but uh, not, not that much. Uh, whereas for the aliphatic uh, nitrogen, the RMSE for aliphatic nitrogen was uh, is sub, uh, substantially higher than the global RMSE, and the same for the um, for the sulfur atoms, meaning that these two uh, pathologies may affect more the the, the RMSE error, uh, the, the global RMSE error. Um, we also uh, then applied uh, the uh, Nagel charge uh, model, but with the BCC correction uh, applied after the, the, the training. And we noticed that, for instance, in this case, this new model is able to correct the, the pathology on, uh, double bonded, uh, on the double bonded carbon that were uh, affected. And we also see that the, the correlation uh, uh, gets better, increase, increases. However, the RMSE for the double bonded carbon is still uh, uh, the same as, as before, uh, meaning that uh, this new model might be able to correct some of the pathologies, but overall uh, does not uh, improve the, the error. Whereas for uh, aliphatic, uh, aliphatic nitrogens, sorry. We also saw that this new model was able to uh, correct some of these uh, pathologic uh, nitrogens. But uh, in this case, the new RMSC for this aliphatic nitrogen uh, increases with respect to the, to the RMSC of aliphatic nitrogens uh, done with by, by Nagol without uh, the BCC applied afterwards. Uh, and the same is happening essentially for the 
sulfur pathologies. So the new RMSE with uh, Nagel BCC, it's higher than, uh, than before. And uh, you will see in the next style, slides, it's, this is just because uh, essentially uh, Nagel BCC is able to correct some of these pathologies So, yeah, uh, so Nagol, uh, it's trained on uh, AM1 BCC, uh, ELF10. Nagol plus BCC, it's trained on uh, AM1, ELF10, and the BCC correction is applied after the, the training, if I'm correct. If I understand, the same, much better, uh, can can you say again? You you mean that uh, Nagol BCC is better than? Uh... Uh, well, anyway, as I was uh, mentioning, um, so essentially Nagol plus BCC um, gets uh, an higher error because generates uh, more. Uh, pathological cases with uh, aliphatic nitrogens. Uh, and here I reported just a few examples and also more cases uh, with pathological sulfur, mainly uh, on uh, thiazole. So the RMSE uh, of Nagel plus BCC is slightly, uh, slightly higher than uh, the RMSE with, uh, with Nagel. And uh, overall, the number of pathological cases is uh, the same as before, so 1.3%. So overall, we can say that uh, uh, Nagel plus BCC is performing slightly worse, uh, um, uh, on, at least on this data set. But uh, I mean, the take on message would be that uh, in general, Nagel is uh, um, performing re really well because of the very, I mean, it's uh, able to uh, reproduce uh, AM1 uh, uh, BCC LF10 charges uh, with a very low RMSE error. And yeah, I will now leave the floor to Bill for discussing the, the dipodes. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yes. So it's. It's correcting uh, these uh, pathological cases and it's correcting also other pathological double bonded uh, carbon, other uh, aliphatic, uh, but it's creating a new one. And for uh, uh, aliphatic uh, nitrogens and sulfur, it creates more uh, uh, pathological cases than, uh, than Nagel. So essentially, yeah, here uh, with Nagel, we have 50% uh, of aliphatic nitrogen and 20% uh, sulfur, which are constituting these. Uh, outliers, but with Nagel plus BCC, this increases. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So the target that was needed was the selection of the actual that's the QM. Uh, yeah. So the, the question in this case was uh, if the, um, so the, the charges were computed uh, with AM1 BCC. But the, the geometries were uh, the 3G, 3D coordinates from the QM optimized uh, structure. And the answer is uh, yes. So. Yeah, well, we, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, a conformationally in independent uh, uh, charge model. Uh, and we, we applied uh, on. Uh, the lowest energy minima conformer, but in principle, we will get same charges for uh, all, 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 all the other conformers. Uh, so yeah, uh, you, you, you are saying that uh, uh, for S. Paloma, uh, you were surprised that it was also conformational independent, right? Deep dependent. Uh, 
No, well, in, in this case, uh, I, I didn't see conformational dependence uh, of, the, of the model, nor, uh, not for uh, Nagel, nor for uh, AIM-1 BCC. Well, I can leave the floor to Bill, and then if there are other questions, we can try and answer. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lorenzo. Oh, the clicker doesn't work. You have to use the. Oh. <laughs> okay. So which? Uh, oh, left yeah, and right, or? Uh, down, down. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm continuing a little bit uh, from what I talked about yesterday with maybe a little bit of twist to it and uh, uh, hopefully a way to make um, lemonade from lemons. Uh, uh, what we looked at and I discussed yesterday was uh, the computation of dipole moment data using DFT and comparing it with what the OpenFF and also the uh, OPLS uh, charge models were producing. This is a little bit of a reminder that uh, these dipole moments are vectors. They uh, range in value uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, in, the, in the bottom right, you can see a, an amide uh, group. These have dipole moments of about four Dubai, which is pretty healthy. And those are actually important for stabilizing helices in protein folding. They line up and uh, re reinforce each other. And a helix has an enormous dipole moment. In a, in a protein. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that contribute to this, of course, electronegativity and so on, but also solvent effects. I need to be louder, okay. Uh, I, I talked about this um, yesterday. I'm not gonna go into it much. We analyzed this industry uh, benchmark data set, which is about you know 10,000 compounds. It's a nice healthy amount of data and you know some of the molecules are ridiculously large or complicated there's ions in there and all kinds of things we filtered out the ions and just looked at neutral species um, we uh, pulled the dipoles from quantum calculations on uh, DFT optimized structures we pulled charges from the force fields we use this uh, the you know, the uh, DFT structures and the charge dipoles to get, you know, force field dipoles and compared them. So I talked about this yesterday, nothing new here. Uh, in comparing these, uh, we wanted to look at, you know, uh, how well each force field does against DFT, what, what might uh, be causing the differences, identify situations that are depolarized, that is where the force field dipole moment is actually less than the gas phase dipole moment, which is a little bit pathological. Uh, we looked at other things besides open FF, in, including Espeloma and the uh, NAGL. Uh, we looked at, of course, OPLS3 and OPLS4. So this is a result slide that I had up yesterday too. Uh, I don't need to talk about this very much. The, um, in the middle, we're comparing charge models against DFT where the, the uh, charges are independent of conformation. And on the right, uh, using OPLS4, the charges are dependent on conformation. So you get a di different charge model for each conformation. So that, that was kind of interesting. For, for one thing, you see if the charge model is dependent on conformation, you can match the, uh, the dipoles, uh, uh, the DFT dipoles pretty well. So uh, what we wanted to do is look at not the cases where the force fields do well, but the cases where the force fields do poorly. And uh, imagine you have compounds where uh, the charges don't move around much as you change conformations. Those are situations where a fixed charge force field should do pretty well. And in that case, you would expect the uh, force fields to give dipole moments similar to the DFT for all conformers, right? But now there's a bunch of compounds where that's not the case where by changing the, uh, the orientation of the molecule or the conformation of the molecule, the charge moves around. And in that case, a fixed charge model is not going to do well. So we wanted to, and of course, there's a number of causes for this that I have listed there. 
what we wanted to do is collect a set of these challenge compounds and uh, uh, use them for testing other ideas. Uh, the other thing was uh, looking at the OPLS4 charges, which are conformationally dependent. We look across the conformers of a given compound and find those cases where there's a large charge difference among conformers. And so that's another indication that um, you've got conformer dependent charges and a fixed charge model won't do well. So here's a sample of some of these. We have you know, dozens of them. Um, these tend to be a little bit large, uh, large-ish uh, for most studies, but we thought this was a good uh, collection of things to establish uh, because it seems like these would be good test molecules for looking at any or uh, charge model averaging schemes or um, if you had fluctuating charges or polarizability, uh, that these might be good molecules for testing uh, the, uh, the efficacy of those different approaches. And also we thought if we had enough of these or somebody other than me might be able to tune or, or establish a, a for some sort of a trained model that would um, identify these so a naive user wouldn't accidentally step into studying a problem that for which you know the force fields just aren't up to it. Um, and that's my last slide. So so if there's any questions, he will answer them. <laughs>